Hi, I'm Pastor Duncan. Welcome to Change the World Church. It's December 20th, 2020. As we prepare for Christmas and think about our Lord and Savior, uh, we just focus on the, the reason for, this, for the, His season. And it's always His season, but we're particularly thinking about the birth of Christ and just celebrate Him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship. Thank you for giving us an extra day, a Sunday, just dedicated to you, Lord. And Every day we pray and worship you, but Sunday is incredible because it's just a day you set aside that we can just, just worship and focus on you. We've had such a day of worship, and as we uh, preach today, um, Lord, we just focus on you in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're uh, given a, a spiritual retreat, mountain retreat, by um, as a ministry gift from... Um, Incredible friends, and so we've come up on the mountain to pray, and we just enjoyed um, just starting. Uh, and we have um, several days of just we're just going to spend with the Lord. And um, this time today has been no different. It's been incredible. We had some fellowship with some friends, uh, but then we just had a day like we do every Sunday, just to worship and focus on Him. And our worship starts. The minute after worship service even i mean we start we review the, the the kids are so excited they share their notes they have these great notes and my wife and we we just talk about the joy and of, of the, the pearls and the things that god's brought from us and the depth of our heart has expanded as we've as we've been as we as you go and you serve god and you faithfully um, are faithfully continuing to persevere um in obedience to him he continues to uh, give you insight and maturity and the walk uh, you spend more time with God and you get you have all the junk out of your life it's like being in the garden with the Lord and that becomes a joy and so worshiping just becomes incredible joy it's like my son said the other day you know it's like pulling out old treasures and new you know and just sharing those because life is incredibly challenging and the more you go for Christ then the world and the devil uh, the accuser comes after you and the Lord is in charge but there's still adversity and you see Paul was so we were talking about it at lunch or after lunch he was shipwrecked and beaten and imprisoned but he had all the joys that went with people coming to the life and even people being healed within a shadow all of Asia heard the gospel and just the, the churches he planted and working alongside and um, obviously uh, people give and he used that the money and the resources people gave for spreading the gospel and he also um, side by side with uh, Priscilla and Aquila uh, so tense you know and um, you do all these things for, for the Lord as you go um, so let's open your Bible open the Word of God to and we're covering Revelation 2, the second church today. We'll be talking about Smyrna. But I like to start with Revelation 1. If you turn to Revelation 1.10, I like to introduce these churches by looking at who gave, who gave the message, who presented the message, and just look and see who John is talking to. And obviously John's on the island of Patmos and writing from Patmos, but as he talks uh, from Patmos, um, who came and who saw him was Christ. And just feeling and seeing the full power of Christ uh, and what he's, as he's, as he's dictating to John what to write is incredible. It gets our mindset. So starting in verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. You can't help but kneel when you read this. Father God, we do come before you as we think about you and your power. 
We just think about your incredible power, God. And uh, we can barely even, we can't even read this without worshiping God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's hard to even get through this without kneeling. You can't, without kneeling before the Lord. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. The first and the last. That first is protos, literally the primary one, the very beginning, the very, very first being of anything. And the last Literally in Greek means the ultimate, the final, the very last. So it's encompassing all time, as much as we can possibly comprehend, infinite, covers everything. The first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Who's that? Christ. Christ has the keys of death and Hades. Christ has the keys to death and Hades. Nobody else has that. Nobody else no entity other than God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, have the keys to death and Hades. Write therefore the things you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And later in Revelation, it talks about the seven spirits before the throne room. And then later it talks about the seven angels as they start to unveil um, the, the different judgments that have come on the earth. It's interesting as I was uh, studying this and looking at different documentaries, everyone's like, oh, Revelation, the mysterious book that talks about the judgment of man and finally coming. It's interesting, and then he's like, but, you know, some people also can see there's some, some nice things in there. There's, there's things about life in Christ. When I read Revelation now, we just triumph. Our family just thunders and rejoicing. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the end is finally coming, and people are having a chance to come to Christ, and everyone who's going to repent, repents, and then it, it's just... It's, it's getting, it's sad, it's extremely sad, the hard-heartedness of the people. And we weep as we see the persecution of the saints. We weep as we see the, the uh, hardness of the hearts of the people as God just gives them opportunity after opportunity. And he just lays his mighty power down. I mean, he sends witnesses, he sends plagues. He's doing everything he can to get people's attention because he wants them to have eternal life. He is he is life. He's a living water. He, he, he's a, he has the keys of death and Hades. And he wants everyone to have that maximum life with him, that joy with him. And he's just doing everything he can in such a merciful yet just way to give people that chance to come to him. And so our heart just cr is crushed as we see, see the masses not coming and not repenting come to Christ. But we rejoice when we see the perseverance of the saints. We rejoice with those who are going. We're saddened and just crushed when people fall away and they, they don't do it or they, they get spit out of God's mouth. But the, the, just, the just and mercy of God is revealed and then the saints in heaven and when heaven at the end and the victory and the crown is so overjoyous, so joyful for us. So that, that's what Revelation is about from, from the eyes of a saint. When you have the Holy Spirit and you've repented and come to Christ, you, you rejoice in the victories, and you you're want everyone to have that. You want everyone to have that purpose and joy that we felt. That's what Revelation's about. To see that, um, start, from the, start from the beginning and come through. Uh, you can read this, but please uh, read the Bible, read Revelation. But as we talked about in the first sermon, you know, Look at our fifth vital sign and read how to come to Christ, how to receive Christ. Um, make a commitment to serve Christ. Once you become a disciple in Christ, um, our Bible series, starting with 
at the, the first sermon walks you through a discipleship program. And that discipleship program will allow you to, to grow and walk with Christ. And if you walk through, the sermons um, are designed to be in order. So this, this is a later sermon. You start at the beginning, grow in Christ, persevere in your walk, and uh, they're designed to go in order. So we invite you to go back, receive Christ, come to Christ, repent. Send us an email if you receive Christ. Um, change the world for Christ at gmail.com. And of course, the sixth tab is the sermons. You must be there already for listening to this. And um, we just invite you to join us today. And uh, we have a great worship team, worship service for you today. And um, we'll, I'll introduce them. Uh, it's, it's Go For Christ, Hebrews 412 Ministries. And what we do is literally take music and um, uh, these young young lady and young men will uh, writing music, and I will too, and mom too. Uh, we write the music to go with the scripture, and um, you literally put the word of God or scripture with music, and they play that because Hebrews four twelve, 4, 12 the word of God is a, is a two edged sword, just like we saw coming out of his mouth, and that penetrates mind, body, and soul, and nobody can do that but the word of God. No surgeon, I can tell you is a. a I can tell you as a surgeon, you can cut through skin and tissue with precision and you can do amazing things with, with the um, instruments we have today, but nobody can cut through the soul except Christ and nobody can renovate the mind and renew and, and nobody else can forgive sins but Christ. Nobody else can conquer death and Hades but Christ. So this sword, the sword of the Lord, is the scripture. The scripture is the word of God as we know from John, we know from our hearts and the Holy Spirit. Uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we know what happens from Romans 1 if you reject God and go down that road. So um, we'll just pray again, then I'll invite the, the worship team to come up. And uh, thank you, Lord, and just uh, praise these guys. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. And everything, every fiber in our bodies, we have this on this mountaintop. We just sing your praises, God, as we get away, just as you did, and pray and 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 sing songs and hymns to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, let's bring the worship. Song. Andrew Duncan, and I'll let him tell you his, uh, the song he's singing, and then he'll be accompanied by Rachel on the first song. This is Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. with endurance we pursue you with everything and we just continue to run for that crown of victory that crown of life but we run just for you lord to serve you just let me pray amen thank you mr andrew duncan now we have rachel duncan singing and miss sarah duncan is holding the lyrics and songs thank you guys this is isaiah 50 27 through 31 
Thank you, God. We do your strength in us. There's no other way we can persevere and continue and run without going worry, without your strength, your living water every day to get rid of flesh and just fill with your living water and to be able to persevere. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for this time on the mountain with you, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for giving this to us. Help us to just maximize everything we do in our lives for you, Lord. Please, Lord, bless this service, and Lord, help us to just take home as much as we possibly can, Lord. Amen. Amen. As we think about the fire lit behind me, we just think about the light of Christ, and the fire of Christ, we just want to, that light to penetrate, that light to penetrate darkness, and come forward in everything that we do and it's just without without God there's no life there's no fire there's nothing okay let's turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2 Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel in the church of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last 
who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. I invite you to open your strongs for those of you who have your strongs. And so we talked about, uh, and to the angel of the church. So the church, G1577, the Greek word is ecclesia. And ecclesia is amazing, as we talked about last week. It's a popular meeting. Uh, it's basically coming together, a Christian community of members and churches, but it includes the whole realm. It includes the saints, uh, heavenly, as well as earthly. That word ecclesia or assembly, saints of heaven and earth are both, is, is, is truly amazing. So you think about these churches. Smyrna, we're going to talk about Smyrna and the location and uh, its significance. Um, but just know that Smyrna was a port city and it was uh, north of Ephesus. And it was located strategically in a really nice uh, port out on a little peninsula and they even had a mountain cliff back behind it and um, some called it the uh, crown of Asia and it was uh, really a, a really superbly important city uh, critical it had a great location it was located in, in the port um, it was ideal for trade um, the word uh, Smyrna uh, derives from uh, myrrh and myrrh, as you know, one of what are the three gifts that they brought to Jesus? Gold, Gold and frankincense, and frankincense and myrrh. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. So we're going to talk a little bit about myrrh. And um, myrrh, it's amazing. So uh, it's, you know where myrrh, anybody know where myrrh is derived from? And frankincense? Plant? Yeah. Myrrh actually uh, comes from the bark of a tree. And I'll show you a picture of the tree in just a minute. And the trees um, popularly that we know of mostly grown in Arabia and there's a certain Arabia uh, version of that tree but also um, Somalia and those parts and um, what you do is you literally uh, they say wound the tree but you, you make a mark on the tree and there's exact points where you can do it and not stress the tree too much but you have to space it out and there's a certain depth and a certain technique and they take these you know um, little kind of uh, not scabbard but um, almost like um, mortar and pestle you know type thing and just kind of make a slice on it and then the first part of the sap comes out but it has uh, white on it and so that's not considered good or viable so then they come back and do a second and a third um, harvesting so to speak and the sap drips out on it and you wait two or three weeks till the sap hardens and then after the sap hardens that's when you go and you harvest it so then you take this sap and you can get seven or nine pounds out of a tree as uh, per season and so uh, that's a I man that's a good that's a good deal and um, you take it and then there's a process of grinding it up and going through it but the amazing thing is is myrrh has many properties so you can actually take myrrh and of course burn it as incense and that was a very spiritual impact because as smoke goes up it's i mean it's literally you know we talk about fragrant offerings to christ and even now the holy spirit and your works your body your life as you give your life to christ and sacrifice everything and do it in a clean way 
as you do those clean things for the Lord on focus for him with the right spirit in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, that's like um, it's like a spiritual offering to the Lord. But imagine doing that and then having that incense or just doing that as, as, a, as a... The ones when you don't do work, when you do works, if you're sinful or you're trying to pray, your prayers go up and you're praying and you're not in alignment with the Lord or you're in sin, that's a malodorous to the Lord. That's a... That is just a stench to God. That's like sinful stench. Oh, I wonder why God doesn't answer my prayers. Well, you're not living for God. You're not going for God. You're not persevering in God. And you're not living a clean life maxed out for Christ. You're not in the scripture all the time. You're not, every part of your life is not focused on the Lord. So every part and fiber is going for God. Everything from the Holy Scriptures, and you're in the scriptures night and day, like we are. We're in night and day, immersed in the morning, in the evening doing Bible study. Um, we're praying all, all week long. We're, we're listening to heavenly music. We're trying to, uh, we listen to Bible study in the morning uh, as, you're, as we're getting ready and we come together as a family. These are the things that prepare your heart, mind, and soul, like Romans 12, 1 and 2, to understand God's good and pleasing will. Then you pray throughout the day. Our whole day and job and business is literally to share the gospel. And yes, we're doing um, orthopedic surgery and we're one of the best sports surgeons because of Christ and the way he works in our life in terms of opening our mind, uh, guiding our hands, the compassion, uh, the wisdom you get you get in that, the, the type. You're trying to, it's a whole mind, body, and soul. The whole body needs to heal, and only God can heal. So when you yield to God, and, and your entire practice is based on um, Scripture, Biblical principle, and integrity, and excellence, and maxing out, then your whole work during that day and your job is focused on Christ and then every other business can work like that and everyone is working with purpose everyone is working giving their um, best to Christ and the Holy Scriptures um, is that purpose you offer that as a holy incense to the Lord and that fragrant incense to God so myrrh can be burned and it has a really interesting scent I want to go through it but um, I'll show you it has just as a as a precursor as a flavor it has like kind of a dark fruity flavor it's thought and uh even some hints of maybe licorice um uh those kind of things um maybe um and frankincense also both those can be a little earthy have a little earthy and it's myrrh you're like wait a minute myrrh bitter wine you know yes it can be mixed with wine there's a bitter component to it and that can um be used to um, actually enhance the wine. Uh, also, could be used uh, for pain, for analgesics. So you can use that literally as kind of a pain relief type thing. It's got antiseptic qualities. They take uh, rags and you mix the the myrrh um, into the uh, into the rags, and it can be used as an antiseptic and literally antifungal, antibacterial, um, antiviral and help to heal wounds or protect uh, cleansing. In fact, some even burn it, and uh, I think it uh, is in one source thought to uh, protect against insects. So it, it clears the insects out, you know, if you're in a bad area that wanna come in. So the, you're offering a fragrant incense to the Lord, you're making your house smell fragrant, yet you're also protecting against insects. Uh, you put the rags on to help, and, and then they can even mix it um, uh, I read a couple things you could mix it with, but you could do it into an, like an alcohol base and mix some other things with it. But it can be used as a mouthwash. And a lot of it was for tooth, teeth disorder. Because, you know, imagine the dental hygiene and care going on. You need an analgesic. So you can do it for an analgesic, but also as an antiseptic at the same time. And so dual properties. And the Lord all using that from, a, from the trees and the, and the sap of that trees and harvesting it. And these are, these are just some of the things. But also has a deeply significant, to us, symbolism. Is reason, one of the reasons Smyrna became so famous and such a powerful city was um, it became a big center of trade. Um, and, and thought focused on myrrh and export of myrrh 
maybe they processed it, maybe they had other trees around there, but who was a big um, utilizer of myrrh? Giant. Yes, everyone liked it who could have it and afford it, but it was used for embalming. So tons of it was exported to Egypt and utilized for embalming and preserving in Egypt because you could make it you know, to a resin. And it was, you know, precious, antiseptic, smelled good, you know, all those properties. And so it was used as a gift for the life of Christ. And so it was presented at Jesus' birth and also represented what was also used in his burial. So his birth and then his burial as it was used to preserve him and all the pounds that they brought and um, Nicodemus was involved you know and um, um, all that and then of course he came back to life again so how powerful is that now think about what goes on in a powerful city that's wealthy and trading in large volumes of myrrh and other things in a port located strategically. It was, it was uh, one of Alexander the Great's uh, cities he wanted to bring back and establish, and then it was a center of the Roman Empire. Um, but it played political favorites, and they always seemed to end up on the upside in all these Roman battles and victories. They always seemed to be on the victory side, if you know what I mean. They're like, oh, clearly we're, you know, for Augustus, he's the man for sure. Or, you know, so they were that kind of city interested in the economic and preserving their economics and their beautiful city and their beautiful port. And they had a, you know, beautiful theater up on the ridge of the mountain. You'll see in a minute that was carved into the mountain and, and this kind of, you know, entrance into the harbor. And so uh, they were very political, very business oriented and very much interested in, in maintaining that well. And the politics kind of went into all that. So I just want you guys to keep that in mind. Okay, so verse, uh, looking in your Strong's. Who is dead? So does that, does that have significance now? Who was dead and is alive? So what a significant place to talk about dead necros, literally necros, which is corpse. Necros and um, necrofascia, we, know we, we use these kind of words um, meaning dead cells and dying and Latin based. So literally corpse, dead, I mean dead. And then alive, the word zeo, really primary verb for to be alive, to have life, to be alive, just literally alive. So what an amazing place where he says, I am you know, the one who is alive, who is dead and now is alive. When we're talking about Smyrna and, and myrrh and these principles and how impactful those were in the life of, of Christ. But it will have even more significance, as you see, going forward. I know they works. We talk about that. Your labors, your investment. You're literally investing in, in you're, you're extracting energy into this, this labor is being poured in. Like you're pouring into the work to Christ and pouring into promoting the kingdom of God and sharing the gospel and working for the Lord. And everything you do is for the Lord. That, and it's, and it's, it's energy take taken out and, and taxed and but paid for it into Christ. That's the kind of um, labor and works we're talking about. And tribulation. Look at tribulation. Philipsis. Literally pressure. Burden. Like a pressure burden. An anguish. An anguish burden. And have you guys have you not have you not been in a situation we've been hard pressed we have been hard pressed for the work of christ i mean pressed and crushed to break 
and not serve God, to break and bail out, to break and compromise our morals. We have been just pressed and, and, and under anguish and just, just hard pressed and squeezed to compromise our morals or to, or to bend our, our work and principles in Christ. And just through sheer, just perspiring energy, almost crushed almost to death at times, and, and extreme inconveniences and extreme situations. And we just, out of just raw faith on our knees, sapped of strength sometimes, just crying out to God, Lord, we want you. We build you. We, we pursue you. And the Lord strengthens us. He guides us. He replaces us. He, he, he goes. But we have felt those pressures and those burdens. And imagine, I mean, like that extreme pressure you have on you, whether it's, it could be physical, it could be mental, physical, uh, it could be uh, an ailment, it could be a, a political, it could be financial, but just an extreme pressure and having that removed, it's like, ah. And that's how they get people to uh, do things, right? You try to, uh, the evil people try to break them and press them, but you can't, if you can't compromise their morals, you either have to bend your morals and compromise and bail out and fall away from Christ, or you continue to pursue Christ with all you've got. So that basically is the option. And that's, that's the kind of oppressive pressure we're talking about. So let's see what these guys may do. Also, their poverty. Poverty, uh, tokia, and literally indigent beggary. Literally and figuratively, poverty. So why do you think they're impoverished? Well, let's think about the politics. I mean, even the synagogue, as we're going to read and get in just a minute, is gone. I mean, the synagogue is politically gone. The, the Jews that are supposed to be coming to Christ, that have been raised up in the biblical principles of the Old you know, Testament, so to speak, and they are, they are in prime position to see the heritage and see the Messiah and all, all the prophecies fulfilled and come to Christ, the repentance. Uh, John laid out the forefront and came back um, like Elijah and basically laid out the forefront just like the angels um, declared and then Christ came and did all those miracles just hundreds and thousands of miracles Paul's come through um, and just all the miracles and preaching everyone clearly knows who Jesus is and all that he does all you have to do is repent and receive Christ they have bailed out on all that and they have gone the way of politics and we're talking about Greek and Roman gods and just debauchery and just awful stuff so they've gone for politics They've gone for politics. They've gone for going with what the Romans want. They've gone for what the, what the Greeks used to do. They go basically the way of the world. This, they've gone the way of Satan is what they've done. They've gone a diabolic way. And so those guys, why did they bend to pressure? Well, guess what? If you didn't go the way of the world, if you didn't go the satanic way and the way that the, the, the Smyrnans wanted you to go, guess what? You got boxed out of the Agora. You, got, you lost your Apple Car play. You lost your place in the marketplace. You lost your, your, your ability to buy and trade. You lost your ability to go to the synagogue. I mean, you lost your ability to be part of society. And so how are you going to get established? Have you guys seen that before in our life? Yes. Going for Christ, and what happens? Next thing you knew, you get a letter, you're boxed out, you're oppressed, you're can't do this, this guy won't do this, this right. So it's 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 literally in getting getting you literally have your ability to physically make a living boxed out by diabolically opposed forces. That the Lord is allowing to happen. And his sovereignty and grace and justice and everything. So guess what? They were, they were poor. Why? They couldn't physically make a living. They couldn't get a foot in the door. They couldn't set up a car. They could not employ their talents to make a living because they were literally boxed out for their faith, for their true faith. But yet they are persevering. 
that they are rich, for they're persevering, and they are rich. Why are they rich? Because they have Christ. Have you seen that in your own life? So what is it to be wealthy? In order to get to heaven, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a physically, monetarily wealthy man, right? But if you give it all to Christ and utilize everything you have for Christ, I mean everything. You're rich, how? Because everything that you didn't even know you could buy, that you wanted to buy, that you never could buy, all of a sudden you have. And that's purpose, and that's, that's doing God's will in the way God intended it, in His perfect design, and implementing that in the way He designed it. And if you want to see how that works, we reference you to the earlier sermons you went through in that order, and you can see how that, how that works. It's beyond comprehension amazing. Jesus is model, just like the early church, like we talked about this afternoon, her friends. Rich literally means abounding with wealth, abounding. And that wealth is all those things we talked about, that if you literally could in the movie, in the show, in the life, at the very end you had you had 30 minutes left and you're like, man, I really wish I had blank, that in Christ, that living water in Christ, that purpose in Christ, that, that work that will sustain because it's Christ's work, not yours. Those are the things. That's really what you, wow, I just wish I would have done that. That's what you're doing. And that is the wealth beyond comprehension. And it's not just, oh, we're working for another day. Yes, we are, we are, we are working to show those, give those gifts before Christ, but we're also now had the opportunity to max out for Christ right now. And that's, that, that's, that's the will. And I know the blasphemy. Blasphemy is really, literally blasphemy. It's literally evil speaking against God. That's literally what blasphemy is. Evil speaking against. They literally have the Greek word is blasphemia. Against them which say they are Jews, but are not. And that's like literally saying they're from the heritage of the Jews, but true Jews are such that they're in a position to behave and act like Jews which are which are deeply steeped in into going through the Bible. But they're not. They're actually a synagogue of Satan. Synagogue, I mean literally assemblage of persons, synagogue of Satan. Literally Satanus. The Greek word is Satanus, which is corresponding to the definite article, which is the accuser, which is the devil. That is what Satanus means. That's the Greek word, Satanus. So they're literally, and why? Because they've chosen what? To bail out from Christ and be go for politics and go for money. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Suffer, past you. Behold the devil. The word for devil, guess what it is in Greek? Diablos. Have you heard that before? Diablos. Literally, false accuser, the slanderer. That's literally what the devil is, a false accuser, slanderer. That's literally what you're up against. Versus God. Fire, flame, burnished bronze, defeated death in Hades. We know sends an archangel to throw him in uh, permanent death, along with prophet and death, and Hades all get thrown in. I mean, the devil can't even go around without God saying, coming to, before God without God inviting him to be able to. Devil shall cast, look at the word for cast. Intent violently cast, violently pour out, strike, throw, thrust. Violently throw you into prison. And the prison is concretely being guarded. Imprisonment. You may be tried, and that's tested, examined, proven, tempted, examined. You shall have tribulation. As again, that's, the, that's that pressured, pressured burden. 
That's that intensive pressure burden. Just pressure burden. Merciful Lord. Here's the mercy of God for how long? You ever been under pressure for a week? For two weeks? For months? For years? That's this is mercifully by God for 10 days. 10 deca, right? Primary number 10. 10 days. Days, the word for days there is uh, dawn and darkness. I will give thee the crown of life. I love this word. You sang about Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 and Isaiah. Listen to this word for crown, Stephanos. It's the it's the wreath, Rachel. They take it and they, Andrew, they intertwine it. Victory wreath. Yeah, the victory wreath. They take it and weave it, and they weave it. It's it's literally the prize for the games, like the the biggest honor you can get. Literally, literally a twine or wreath. The crown that they give you is a victory of the games. The crown of life, life against Zoe just means life he that hath an ear let him hear we talked about our physical ear spiritually hear literally hear what the spirit says pneuma remember the blast the breath pneuma the pneuma breath life spirit your breathing is pneuma pneumatics the pneumology the study of lung pneumothorax you know pneuma the spirit saith unto the churches ecclesia he that overcometh. Overcometh is Nikeo. Nikeo is conquer, prevail, victory. You conquer, you prevail, you're victorious. Will not be hurt. And hurt, again, is adikeo, which means unjustly wronged. Hurt and injured and offended. I mean, in a way that is wrong. The second death, that word for second is second. And that death, Thanatos, properly, literally, figuratively, deadly. So let me just pray again. Father God, thank you for being the head of the keys of life and death. For giving us the victory. If we press on and overcome, we persevere in you, Lord. We know we get that victory. We know that you'll give us, you will, you will come and give us life. And thanks for your mercy with these saints as uh as i read this and it just uh wept in my heart lord and physically wept lord as i as i thought about their pain and i thought about their oppression and i thought about the injustice and how they were treated and i thought about how they suffered those 10 days lord and just how they had been ostracized and kept in poverty and just persevered under huge stress and burden in, in that society and how unjust the society was, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for being the giver of life and for, for receiving those saints, Lord, and our fellow brothers. Jesus, let me pray. Amen. All right, let me show you some of the things to highlight it because uh, I just find that it, um, it brings the Scripture to life. Let's bring the Scripture to life as we uh, just go through some of these things. So you guys oriented here, you know the Aegean Sea. You see the Aegean Sea here, and uh, this is modern day. What 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 modern day country is that? Turkey. Mm hmm. Turkey. Good. I saw mom got it first. And then um, what's over here? Greece. Greece. Good. So Greece is over here. Greece is over here, Crete's down here, Patmos over here, and then the first two churches are here, and we'll show you all the churches of Asia. Now these churches, he's specifically writing to these churches. I mean, these are words specifically written to those spirits and, and angels of those churches. But these churches also represent modern day, and every one of the problems that can be associated with those can be associated today and all those principles also apply to the believers of today. So we're going to take those principles that are timeless and apply them across the board to just persevere, overcome, max out for Christ and use every possible resource for the Lord 
and avoiding the sins and um, trying just just um, people that don't you know come or overcome, but you, we must overcome as a church and persevere and, and do these things. So let me just back up. We'll come uh, back to this video. We'll we'll start with um, here. I love this. Look at this. Here's the ancient Smyrna. Here's their, their theater they were so proud of up on the ridge of the mountain. Here's one of the peninsulas jutting out. Here's the bay that comes in. And look, they had an entrance to the harbor. They had the Agora here. It was just a beautiful place, you know, uh, with people and thriving and wealthy and, you know, synagogue, all those things. So here, here's what myrrh looks like. Isn't that cool? Here it is crushed up, here it is being prepared. They can make the oils or incenses out of it. Uh, you can sell it like this. Um, in some cultures, married women, after they got married, uh, they would have myrrh and they would wear it on their hips. And they would smell good, but also be a sign that they were had a husband. And, you know, uh, taken. Um, here is myrrh that, like, for example, the Magi might have brought. And so that's a pretty powerful example. So here's a tint of myrrh, and you can use it for medicinal purposes. You know, you can antiseptic, you can use it for wounds, uh, you can use it for perfumes. Here's a example, the Comifora uh, galilianus are also listed as um, balsam odrindum uh, arum burganium is this particular species. And that balsa, balsa wood and literally like gum, gum of a tree. So that's pretty cool. So the tree gum that it used, uh, all the way from medicine to Horn of Africa and of course the biblical significance. Well, here's a picture I thought that was really beautiful. You know, it reminds you of almost a jewel, you know, that sap that's come out and harvested and brought. We come down here. Yeah, let me go back to this one. We go down. And there's also facts of frankincense and myrrh. Smoke and bomb. It can, um, like, kind of for uh, for just worshiping. They call it tears of Alubanum. And the only bottom tears because as, as the tree uh, releases the sap, they look like teardrops. And so that's one of the things that they uh, look like. Um, frankincense, different from myrrh, but similar. Frankincense also used for many of these uh, properties and um, for burning incense. And, um, but it almost, uh, they said almost at first when you're burning it, it has a green peppery uh, kind of scent. And then it finishes with a white pepper. So the frankincense has a little more peppery along with the aromatic and also has a little bit of a woodsy, uh, like fresh woodsy, almost sweet in a way and then not. Myrrh not only is not just bitter, but also has uh, sweet properties as well. So it kind of has both. It's very interesting. So you can make a resin, which is uh, heavy. Um, it can be soft. It, it also kind of uh, dries a little bit, more aromatic. Again, myrrh can be kind of bitter. And they said it almost has a dark fruit, kind of like um, for the perfume smell, and then maybe a little black licorice, and, and it finishes with charred rock. That's, that's kind of interesting. Women, the Egyptian women use it as eyeliner to help with the eyeliner. Some makeup properties as well. So really uh, amazing. And as you know, had a powerful symbol of uh, death, but also uh, life as well because of the Magi, right? And as Christ came back to life. So here's some verses I want you guys to read. Maybe Andrew, could you turn to um, Genesis 37, 25? 
I might have you also read Genesis 43, 11. Um, Mom, could you turn to Exodus 30, 23? And then Rachel, uh, and we always encourage everyone to have a Bible, you know, a good study Bible with them. It's really important as you have that Bible, you can physically, tangibly read it. I see Andrew turning, and that's good. Rachel, if you don't mind reading Esther 2.12. You'll, you'll love that verse as you turn to it. And then Andrew, you'll do, I can read the rest of it in a minute. So while you guys are turning there and preparing, we'll read all the different Bible verses about myrrh. Here's the name. Another name is Comifora uh, Abyssinica. How about that for a name? I, Abyss, you know? Here's what the tree looks like. How cool is that? So it's a, kind of a, just a ruddy, spiny tree, and it's just it's a hardy tree that can grow in some of these you know, tough environments. You think it's gonna be this you know, giant, majestic tree that's producing sap, but it's just it's this scrappy tree, and if you get closer, it literally has the spikes in there. It's kind of hard to get in there, and people pass the secrets down from generation to generation. It's a woody, almost a scrub, a sturdy, it's almost a sturdy, spiny scrub, Scrub, scrubby tree, short trunk up to four meters tall, outer bark is silvery, whitish, reddish, or bluish gray, peeling a little bit. It's pretty bark, I feel like. And here's a close up of kind of the, the leaves that you might you might see and the flowers. Different abbreviations for it. Alright, and here's um let's talk let's do Genesis thirty seven twenty five. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. So, uh, what was that in reference to? Uh, the, bur the burial in Egypt it was used for. Yep. And what what were they, what um, was that caravan doing there at was, the time? It um, to sell Joseph. Yeah, good, good memory. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but good job. Crushed it. Yeah, so they were literally a caravan on their way to Egypt. How, how amazing is that? With the myrrh and the other spices that we are learning significance. They mentioned cinnamon a lot today. Um, and then um, they were going to use them to trade, right? So there it was. It's a major part of culture. Okay, the next one is Genesis 43, 11. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. So pistachios, almonds, myrrh, you know, so they were doing that to try to appease the second command because, you know, yeah. Joseph. Pretty amazing stuff, huh? Exodus thirty twenty three. Take also for yourself the finest of spices, of flowing myrrh 500 shekels, and of fragrant cinnamon half as much, 250, and of fragrant cane, 250. Yeah, so there it is again. 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, and then half as much of fragrant cinnamon and calamus. Esther, you'll like this first, Esther 2.12. Now when the turn came for each young woman, to go into King Ahasuerus after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women. So in order for the woman who'd been selected to present themselves to the king, they literally had to go a year of training. And the year of training, not only beautification, to make sure they had their act together, you know, but also even how to work properly with the myrrh and how to work properly with the others. So how many months was it of each? It was six months? Uh, six months of oil of myrrh and six months with spices. So six months of myrrh training and then six months of spices just to, just to have it like king level, court level ready. How amazing is that? It's a big deal, myrrh, huh? It's pretty amazing, huh? Okay, so um, now we're, next set is, Andrew's got Psalm 45a, and also we'll do Proverbs 7, 17. 
Um, Mom, you've got the Song of Solomon verses. There's several of them. Let me just kind of read them to you as we go. It's 113, 36, 46, 414, 51, 55, and 513. I picked mom because that's an adult level uh, scripture, you know, but I've heard from you, know, husband. And then we got um, Rachel, uh, turn your Bible to Matthew 2, 11. And you can also do Mark 15, 23. You'll have to flip quickly. And then um, Andrew, let's do John 19, 39. And uh, Revelation eighteen thirteen. Yes, sir. As you read, look look at this uh, flower here. How amazing is that? Wow. Okay, so where are we, Psalm? Yes, sir. Forty five eight. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Okay, next one, you got Proverbs 7.17. So stay away from the woman who's trying to seduce you, right? She leads to death, as we know from Proverbs 3. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. So, oh, so, it's the adulteress. So if a woman comes up to you saying that, and she's not your wife, then... Just say no. Run. Yeah. <laughs> say no and run. Good job. Okay. Um, Sarah. Okay. Song of Solomon 113. My beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh, which lies all night between my breasts. Yeah. Three, From six. For your wife. Is, there, is your wife. What is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and fran frankincense? with all scented powders of the merchant. So you're in love and you're still enjoying 22 years of honeymoon and you're, you know, want to make sure you're, you are just present yourself, Max, me for your husband. He wants to make sure he's for you. And these are some of the things that go into that is making sure you got the myrrh and the frankincense and all that. Okay, four, six. Until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Mm -hmm. 414. Nard with saffron, calamus, and cinnamon. With all the trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, along with all the finest spices. And the nard was that concentrated form of that. So you get it really down and you could use it for lots of things. If, um, yeah, for your the, the woman that washed yeah Jesus's feet, maybe use her hair as well. Mm -hmm. And five one, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends, drink and imbibe deeply, O oh lovers. So these are just this is like in the throes of the gifts of the Lord, and He's given you this wonderful. Spouse, you're gonna. It's a garden of God. You're gonna spend your life with, and the closest thing we can even imagine to the garden of the Lord is, you know, to have these wonderful fragrances and just offerings to the Lord that you, as an example of marriage, as an example of Christ. And, you know. and five five, I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bowl. She's in love. <laughs> and 5.13. Um, his cheeks are like a bed of balsam, banks of sweet-scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping with liquid myrrh. Amen. I think they have affection for each other. Okay. And then um, Matthew 2.11 and Mark 15.22. Yes. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gift, gold and frankincense and myrrh. These are the wise men. How about that? Wow. I mean, I mean, that was like the ultimate gift from the ultimate wise men with a 
the star shining down, and they talk about, um, I mean, there's nothing to explain that star other than just God put it there because they followed it as a star, and then it stopped and then shone down. I mean, you know, other than just angels or God's light majestically and supernaturally placed there to do that. Yeah. And then this is Mark fifteen twenty three, And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And so that was the effort, that was uh, the analgesic, the wine and analgesic, um, even for filling scripture. And then, you know, and that's why it's a little bitter because a lot of times that portion of murder was, was more bitter. But now that makes, that brings that passage out more. Not only presented at the beginning as a, a, a thing they could use for trade and bartering and passage to Egypt as they had to flee to Egypt, right? And how valuable was that in Egypt? So they were about to head to Egypt, you know, when, when um, Herod, you know, did the massive killing of the innocents. And, um, um, but also that it would be it later bomb Christ and then he would come back to life. It was also something that could healing, provide healing. And you could burn it as an incense, a holy sacrifice also. Um, just incredible. And then they would also offer it to him on the cross. So. Did we do? Okay, John 19, 39. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. 75 pounds. Nicodemus, same one that had gone to him in the garden. It specifically says it was Nicodemus that brought the how cool is that? Super. Yeah. And then we have um, Revelation 18.13. Cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is, human souls. So all these things are valuable things, even going on in, in, the, in the very end, they're being utilized. Here's showing just some of the runs, what that looked like, its location in Turkey. Here's showing the key cities um, around, and right there, Smyrna located. Look at that key port and protections coming in. It shows the Agora of Smyrna. Here it is again, right on the water. And just uh, some of the other things there. Here's a close up again. You'll recognize some of these things. Ephesus here, right? Talked about that. Smyrna, Pergamum. And then we start getting into some of the other churches here. We'll see in a moment. So this just shows a blowout. Seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Iotyra, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Pat Patmos. And uh, here's the Aegean Sea, here's Greece. You can see right here, look at this, right in that protected inlet. Of course, Pergamum and Ephesus also were strategic. And look at the other ones, one, two, three, and then you come right down, four, five, six. Through there. Here's Cyprus, the P is Patmos, here's Patmos. So it kind of shows you where uh, John was um, in prison, suffering for Christ, when Christ visited him uh, to write to those churches. And that shows just a really kind of a clear map of the location of those uh, churches that he was writing to. This kind of shows the topography. Here's Patmos here, and it shows you more, I think I can feel more physical distance on getting to Smyrna here, just around the horn. And here's Ephesus, there's the first one. 
He walked his way up the coast and then came down Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. So a lot of these uh, these trees that we're talking about, frankincense and myrrh, and those types of trees and the bushes, they grew well. They grew well down in Somalia, uh, down in here. Also, Oman is kind of a famous place where they grow. There's Arabian ones as well. Um, here's the Red Sea coming up here. And uh, just to give you a uh, reference point here, you got the Mediterranean here. Here's Izmir. Today is used to be Smyrna. That's it, Izmir, right there. So um, if you're doing a med pack from the, you leave uh, the Navy from the East Coast, from, from Virginia Beach and these areas, Hampton Roads, you're going to come through here. You're going to go through the med cruise. If you want to get to the Middle East, you cut through Suez Canal and come through the uh, Red Sea. And that's how you get to the Persian Gulf. Uh, if you did a Westpac like I did, then you come in from the Indian Ocean, from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean, and we came in through the Arabian Sea, and then we deploy right up in here. And uh, um, our ship uh, was parked here, and then at that point we were between Desert Storm 1 and 2, and so we did a mock invasion. I was selected to do part of the helicopter invasion team, and uh, the LCACs came in deployed them out the back and they floated in here. So those guys hit the beach. My squadron came over here. And uh, on that mission, I was actually um, to just, it was a drill, so we weren't actually firing. It was a exercise, so they let me do the 50 cal. So as we came over the mountains here, I shot the 50 cal um, just into the water. We came over these beautiful mountains and landed, and then we worked with the Omanians. They had the British kind of red fatigues, and we shot, worked with them on how to do different weapons trainings that I've told you guys about. And off in the distance, as I'm sitting in this wadi of this, of this desert, there's all these scrub trees around. And uh, one of the um, Johnny sergeants pulled me aside and said, hey doc, you know that's frankincense. This is where it is, and so some of the last frankincense trees, they actually have a wadi now that preserves those and they use them to preserve because they got over harvested for a while and they're retaining them, they grow well and they're starting to grow them. Um, it's just these incredible red mountains as you come over and you know this is one of the most dangerous places. You come in past Muscat and the Gulf of Oman, it's kind of a choke point and then once you get through here, I was in Dubai, you know we have some um, um, you know about Dubai, I've talked to you about different places. You guys have been to Dubai, remember we, we stayed in the um, uh, safe house there on our way to Bangladesh and they put us away and then we went and um, had to procure some things there. And then um, here's Gutter. Dad went into Gutter and I uh, met with some of the embassy members there and looked at a medical triage plan and then we went from Gutter into Bahrain. And you guys have heard the stories from, about Bahrain and you know, uh, some of the things from that, and then we went up in here, and that's where you remember the, the mission I talked about into Kuwait, and um, we came back from that uh, in the Cobra, and that was that was through here. And, uh, and so, uh, when you're thinking about where these things are growing or what's going on nowadays, this aerial view, this is the mountains we flew over. So imagine coming in off the ship and just these red, rugged mountains and just coming over that and then just, you know, dun 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 and coming down and just a whole fleet of the um, 46s back then and 53s and then you're coming over those mountains majestically and landing in the desert was really unbelievable, you know. And so, look, here's kind of a close up what they look like, and then imagine coming out of the Gulf and just into that, and then landing over that. And then um, coming in, showing the Wadi. That's what it looked like. Imagine a helicopter we came in like this, lower to the ground, and then just rose up, and then that's where we're laying down the cover fire. I 
heard you. Like this. Why do you have those? Um, these, these bushes, and uh, let's see if we can find the other one. And it's kind of a similar scrub scrub brush looking in the desert. And we have these wadis and then these kind of bushes and scrub bushes out in the desert and just uh, poking like that. So these little scrub brushes. So in the in the book, um, the Church of Smyrna, he said, "You've been oppressed. You've been oppressed. Stay strong. Persevere. You're going to get thrust in the prison by the accuser, which Satan. It's going to be ten days, and you're going to, you're going to be killed. And um, you persevere to the end, and then you're going to have the crown of life. And so." You persevere, you overcome, you press on, and you work max out for Christ for the time you have here, and whatever um, whatever his task is for you, you max out for him. You give it all, you die to self, you give everything to him. And then that crown of life, you get the, the fullness of knowing you're in his purpose, in his majesty, in his life, all on this earth, which is the richness, and then you spend eternal life with Christ. Thank you, God, for being the author and perfecter of faith, the first and the last. You're the one who, how appropriate. You said, I am the one with the, who, who, who died and came to life. As these, these saints, these persevering ecclesia, members of the church, were about to persevere and be put to death, and knowing that you were the one that came to life. And then, in, of all places, Smyrna of of myrrh and that represents the the life that you had but being buried in death and embalmed and the death that that brought but that you overcame that and the gift of life which was you christ as you we celebrate your birth and we celebrate christmas and that myrrh was presented to you before your 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 throne room at the time in that humble place that you came and the way you, you just came to, or majestically, the kings, you're the king of kings and lord of lords. And the king, the, the top wise men, presented that myrrh to you and the life that you gave and the life that you give us today, Lord. We, we thank you for that. And we give it all, and all we give to you, and we bow before you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.